Hey guys, this is uh, Jonathan McCormack. I'm an attachment specialist in New York. You can find me at attachmenthealinghelp.com. I'm going to talk about love. Uh, this is going to be more about emotional needs than, than sexual. Uh, I'm going to give a meditation on self-love for the inner child. And I'm going to tell you how people fall in love, how you can fall in love, how you can make someone fall in love with you. I, I can do that. Uh, I'll tell you what exactly you're looking for, who your match will be, how to do that. I'll do that in three parts. And uh, usually I like to recommend a book. Pretty decent book on this is Nicholas Boothman. He did a book, How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less. Uh, he did one on the same thing with love, how to make people fall in love with you in 90 minutes or something like that. But the truth is that you want love by design. I still think once you find love, you're going to need to uh, heal your attachment wounds. And I do ideal parent figure meditation and parts work just for that. But regardless, regardless, there's things you can do to up your chances to find that person and to let it be long lasting. This is a design for love and you can design it. This is about understanding the process of falling in love with the right person. That's important. We can all fall in love. We don't know the wrong person. And also making deliberate steps to make it happen. Uh, I'll kind of be going over just how to manage the risk and excitement, how you can move through those steps as quickly as possible, how to navigate them. Then the second part, uh, I'll probably talk about kind of how to fine tune your presentation, uh, make that first impression, optimize your rapport skills, uh, being able to connect, you know, and then sliding into the uh, intimacy, self-disclosure, uh, sharing that confidential information, how to do that. Um, so the first part is really understanding who you are, you know, um, the, the truth is though, you, you don't need long to know someone, uh, you can kind of figure these things out pretty quickly, a lot more quickly if you know what you're looking for. First thing I'll say, falling in love, staying in love, those are two completely separate events. Falling in love is addictive and it's intoxicating, it's exciting, it's a chemical affair. But believe it or not, you don't fall in love with people. No one does. We don't fall in love with people. We fall in love with the feelings. We fall in love with the feelings we get when we're with them. That's what you fall in love with. Those feel how they make you feel the spiritual and the emotional awakening, the erotic awakening, the lowering of inhibitions, the, just the joy of feeling safe, feeling warm, that feeling of hope. We know, we know that feeling of hope. You know, boom, could it be? Oof, you know. The feeling of completeness. Oh, this person kind of fits right. And the thrill, you know. You take all those, Turn them into stories, share them with each other, and those stories are told and retold and told until a romance begins to grow. And at that point, we're talking about staying in love, and that's a little different. The truth is that the exciting, loving, lasting relationships are kind of an artful blend of two elements. You need just the right amount of similarity, like, like attracts like, so you actually respect and can put up with each other. And you need just the right amount of opposites attract, just so you can enjoy being silly and keep the sparks flying. You need both. This is the key. Uh, people say, like, opposites attract. Not really. 5% of the time, those work out. You know, like you try. No, no, no. It has to be both. And I'll, I'll tell you exactly how. But it has to be both. You have to be the same in very important ways, usually about values, and different in other ways, personality. So when you're looking for someone, I'll, I'll let you know what, I'll go through a 
chart or something and tell you this is you know, four basic personalities. So you pick someone who has the opposite personality, but both of you have the same values. So similar and different. That's what makes a long lasting relationship. Um, the most successful couples, after you pour through the information, they kind of embody that delicate balance of both those, both those maxims, like attracts like, opposite attract, they incarnate both. Um, so sometimes people ask me like, so how do I know this is the right person? Well, uh, when you fall for someone new, you know, there's the head spinning and the excitement and the desire. And there's also tension. But when you meet the right person, this is what we call the matched opposite. You're matched in some ways, opposite in others. And the ideal in the lingo, I'll tell the lingo of the game. By the way, the things I'm saying, I've seen people give workshops on this. It's charging like $500. Yeah, you know, this, is, this is for free. Um... Uh, the matched opposite, as they say in the in the game, uh, when you meet that matched opposite person who shares your values, but has an opposite personality, that tension gets replaced as you deepen with an enormous, unmistakable sense of calm and relief. That's how you feel. That's how you know you, and hopefully the other person feels the same way. That's how you know you emotionally regulate each other. That's the most important thing, number one. Number one, more than anything else. Do you feel safe and calm? Is your, you have to know how to emotionally regulate them, and they you. And this should happen naturally. Sometimes you might have to mechanic it a little bit. But do you feel safe? That excitement, in it, well, yeah, that lasts a minute, but does it go into this calm, safe relief okay well the first steps towards falling in love is you have to know yourself to know who will complete you and there's different types of love by the way richard rapson elaine hatfield there's some other person in the university of hawaii though they kind of say there's two main types of love uh passion love and compassionate love and, and of course you want both that they define passionate love as kind of like this intense continuous longing you know that longing for desire you know, sexual feelings with the emotional but the compassionate love is really not as lit it's more tender tender we've had those moments you know, with your baby girl we are just like oh like she's so tender you're so precious to you you'll do anything it's tender and it's feelings of trust trusty feelings you know you have her back and you know she has your back and so you're attached you're no longer just sexually excited no no now you're attached and you want to commit to that person you know uh robert sternberg the uh, professor of education at yale he's a yale he kind of has like this triangular theory it's um kind of thinks it's made up of passion intimacy and commitment yeah, yeah, you know, that's great. The passion is the physical part. Uh, the intimacy is what you enjoy being close. And the commitment is your mutual agreement on what it takes to make a relationship work. That's fine. That's a fine definition. That's what we're talking about. And it, it will go in stages, by the way. Four stages. There's four stages of love. Because love is not just a feeling. It's a process. It's something you do. Love is something you do. It's not just a feeling. Love is something you do. And also something that happens to you. It's the emotions. It's the physical. But it's the actual process that love unfolds. It unfolds with a natural progression. It goes from attraction to connection to intimacy to commitment. And boom. That's all it takes. So the first stage is mainly, we know about physical attraction. Um, that just gets triggered, nonverbal cues, eye contact, you know, attitude, clothing. We know that. The next three are really about mental and emotional attraction. That's what I'll concentrate on. Um, it, it's about developing intimacy. It's about sharing confidences. How does it begin? Ask couples. I've asked a lot. 
usually begins with boom, a smile and a look. That's how great loves begin. Just that smile, welcoming smile, that look, you know. Um, so that is great mutual attraction. That'll just happen. That's wonderful. You're mutually attracted. That's just one. That's just paving the, the way towards the second step of love, which is connecting. Um, connecting, I get it's difficult. Uh, you got to send the right signals. You got to say the right things. Um, you want the connection to be easy and comfortable, right? Not a lot of work now at the beginning. It's got to be easy and comfortable, you know? And if you can navigate that, then it's time to move on to intimacy. And what do I mean by intimacy? I mean talking, really, actual intimacy. Yeah, I know you're hoping something else. No, get your minds out of the gutter, people. This is about talking and keeping them talking. This is intimacy, like, wow, I feel so safe and I trust you. Now I'm gonna start sharing, um, you know? Uh, and believe it or not, there's a lot of studies that just emotional feedback, emotional feedback, shared between people that actually, when they're in love, it balances, regulates, it influences their vital blood rhythms, uh, it keeps them healthy, heart rate, blood sugar, uh, hormonal balance, all improved when someone's emotionally united. So people say they have real chemistry. Yeah, literally, they do. They have great chemistry. It's not just a metaphor. People in love don't just come alive. But they stay alive and they live richer, healthier, more exciting lives. People are alone. People don't understand how hard it is. You're never emotionally regulated when you're alone. You can be, not never, but oftentimes you're not. Um, you don't have that hormonal balance, you know? And you, oftentimes you just feel dreadful for, for no reason. But it's for an important reason. You're not connected. Now, now, if you have a bunch of friendships, but I tell you, friendships are getting harder and harder today. And so that's one of the reasons you probably don't feel good. Um, okay, so how do you do this? Well, you're gonna, it, it's a couple steps. Uh, you're going to have to evaluate your self-talk, you know, your inner monologue. You're going to have to explore your values, your motivators, right, to find out who you are. And then you're going to look at your personality and behavior, you know. What do I mean by that? Because we're looking for your, your matched opposite. I mean, are you an extrovert or introvert? Rational or emotional? Those are the two most important things, really. And once you have a greater understanding of yourself, then you can kind of work out the type of person that you're most likely to be successful with. Um, um, so if you want to know about yourself, there are some questions. I, I, I would write this down, and if I'm working with someone, I will have them write this down. What five words like best describe you? What five words do you think someone else, your friends, would use to describe you? That's an interesting one. And now check if they're similar. You know, you've, these are the five words. I mean, these are the five words. Are they really different? You know, think about that. Um, with the exception of, of your looks, what's the best compliment someone could give you? Forget about looks for a second. This one's vital. If you can answer this, we can find you a positive ops real quick. What's the best compliment someone could give you? Really think about that. Uh, obviously my hair looks great, so yeah, but I would want to be confident like in my intelligence. That's where my vanity, you know. Um, finally, you can ask, uh, what are the three most important qualities for a friend to have? And then a romantic partner. You know? So just to explain what we're doing here, this is the process of completion. Um, you ever hear people in a long-term relationship, she makes me feel whole. We just feel right. Both partners are going to bring to the relationship qualities the other lacks that's important that's important and that's why together they feel whole you know uh, they feel greater than their sum of their parts this is where the life comes in because together they are more than they are from each other that's where this extra excess of vitality in life comes from um, so basically these couples six of them tell them they're psychological opposites you know 
there's there's complementary psychological opposites, and, and that's what they're, they're complementary psychological opposites. Uh, what did Shakespeare say? No, no, Socrates, in our lover we seek and desire that which we do not have. Yes, you know, Socrates says that whole, whole thing about uh, Plato's Symposium, remember the... Uh, you know, the, the, the first guy goes and goes, oh, we used to be circles around. We broke apart and female, male. Now we're always searching to get together. And I don't know, maybe we'd be circles. I've seen people together. They don't look around, but maybe that's just me. Maybe people are bigger back then. Um, so the truth is that that's what you want. Your lover has to have the things that you lack. Um, familiarity, friendship, shared motivations, those aren't enough. Yeah. Uh, they just won't sustain a romantic relationship. You know, they're nice. They need something extra. That extra something. People are like, what is that extra something? What is that extra something? That's where the opposites come in. You know, people with different personality and behavior traits complement each other. You want the same values. But, but personality is different, you know, and usually polar opposite. Uh, what does this look like? Listen, if you're an assertive, impulsive person, person you get with, uh, you probably want them to be very laid back. But they're so laid back that, boy, they get energized when they're around your assertiveness. You know? Um, okay, so just, you're just going to ask yourself two questions. It's pretty damn easy. Do you consider yourself to be more rational or more emotional? And do you describe yourself as more socially outgoing? Or socially reserved you know so who would I want to see hook up well I would see want to see Sarah who's rational and socially reserved hook up with my boy Alan because he's rational but socially outgoing so we have the similar they're both rational and then we have the opposite and that's what you want. But just ask yourself those two things, very basic. Am I more rational? Am I, am I more accurate? Okay. Now look for the opposite in one of those. And the same in the other. Um, I'll, I'll give you the different types. Uh, and you can locate yourself in this. Bunch of different ones out there. For this, for pairing romantic partners, probably the best is the DISC system. Do you guys know that? It's a D-I-S-K. Okay, so it stands for D-dominance. That's the controller. If you're a controller type, right? If you're dominant. I would be for influence. That's the promoter. Always trying to influence that. Are you a promoter? S would be for steadiness. That's the supporter. That's the person that's always in your, cheer, your cheerleader, in your corner. I'd say for compliance. Compliance would be the analyst. You know, people are super analytical. I could be like this. People are super analytical, intellectual. If the, unless they're balanced, they could be more compliance. You can kind of tell they, they don't. They're just like in their heads all the time, you know. And boy, they don't, they don't have a whole lot of uh, get up and go, you know. Okay, well. Remember previously, I was like, oh, what do, you, what do you like to get complimented on? Because this is how you'll know. You'll know if this is your partner, how to handle them. An analyst needs to feel intelligent. Needs to feel intelligent. I'm kind of like this. I got to be smart. You got to tell me how smart I am, right? A controller, someone's dominant, they need to feel powerful. If your man's the controller, make them feel powerful. Promoters usually do best when they feel important. They want to feel important, you know, supporters. So if that's you or your girl, if that's your girl or your guy, then yeah, make them feel important. Like, oh no, you did a great job, that's wonderful. They're promoted, oh, look what I did, look what I did. I did this and I did that. Did you notice that I did this, you know? Wow, you did a great job, you know? And supporters uh, like to feel valued, you know? A lot of women are supporters, uh, among other things, and they want to feel valued. If the man is, um, the supporter, you know, not provider, but someone who would just support. Yeah, honey, you're doing great. You're doing great. He wants to know that he's valued. Like, okay, I appreciate you telling me this. Tell me, I really appreciate your support on this, honey. You know. Um. So how do you know? Well, well, well 
So when, when you ask, like, oh, why are you with this girl? Why are you with her? If you ask, like, boy, why are you with her? Why are you with her? An analyst would say, well, I just feel like I'm the smartest guy in the world and I'm with her. That's how I feel. I just feel like I'm brilliant. I just feel like she really gets, she really sees my, you know. What if you were the controller? Well, that person might say, oh, why am I with uh, him or her? Oh, well, they make me feel strong. I feel so strong around them. I'm around them, I feel strong. I feel like I have that sense of power. I'm in control. Well, if that's your man or your girl, that, that's, that's the way you're going to have to handle it. You know, really make that, let them know. Let them know. Help them feel strong, you know, if you love them. A supporter, well, she makes me feel needed or he makes me feel needed. Yeah, and women, especially anxious people, male and female, they need to feel like they're needed, okay? Don't make them ask. Tell them. But if you're a supporter, yeah, and apply these to you. If you're a supporter, then yeah, you, this is one of your needs. You need to feel needed. And that person needs to do that. If they don't, you are not going to feel regulated. You are not going to feel respected. So if you're a supporter, you know, if you're the analyst, you need to feel intelligent. Uh, um, you know, um, a promoter, when the, you know, well, she makes me feel like I'm important. I'm very important. I'm an important man. I drive a Prius. I'm super important. And she lets me know what an important man I am. You know, but it could be anything. It could be anything. You know, just, I'm, I'm doing these stereotypical things, but you know. Uh, but, and if you are you're a promoter, you need to know that you're important. I had a guy tell me the other day, it's like, <laughs> he slammed the door and goes, I need to feel, what did he say, not admired. Uh, maybe uh, adored. I need to feel adored. And he did. He was just one of those guys. Yeah, could we have worked like a year and changed that? Well, unless it's pathological, like he wants to be worshipped. Yeah, that's a problem. But he kind of just had to have a woman kind of adore him in, 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 a, in a basic way. Um, and by the way, ask these people who are in good relationships, like, oh, why are you with them? Oh, they make me feel adored. I'll give you some other adjectives. But that's, you, you can literally... When you ask these questions, whatever they say, you can put them in these four categories. And ask those people, oh, so what about your last, your ex? Did they make you feel intelligent? Did they make you feel that way? And they'll always say, like, no, and I never got that from them. Oh, wow, really? Um, so ask yourself, you're in a relationship right now. How does that person make you feel? No, no, not everyone's going to use those words. Intelligent, powerful, valued, important. They may use other words. Uh, instead of intelligent, uh, a lot of answers will be like, oh, they make me feel sensible, clever, correct. They make me feel insightful. You know, being around him or her makes me feel wise. I, I feel like I'm taken seriously. That's the intelligent analyst. I'm playing those words. For the controller, a lot of times you won't hear, they make me feel powerful. They won't say that, but under powerful be a lot. Like they make me feel courageous. They make me feel confident. Uh, yeah, they make me feel motivated, strong. She, she makes me feel strong, you know? Uh, make me feel like a champion, self-propelled. Like, yeah, I can just do it, you know? Powerful, that's what that means, powerful. Uh, valued, you know, if someone needs to be valued, you might say, like, well, they make me feel cherished. They make me feel useful. They make me feel part of something. They make me feel precious. They make me feel interesting. And if you're someone who needs to feel important, you'll, you'll hear them say words like, oh, they make me feel like a hero. Uh, they make me feel um, popular, that I have a lot of influence, whatever, you know. Um, Analysts in general are rational sinkers and they're very socially reserved, you know. And they're more interested in getting things done right than getting them done. I, I'm kind of like, like analysts, like, like oh, did you finish that? No, no, I've been thinking about it for like the past 18 years. Um, still thinking about it though. I haven't, I haven't got to figure it out. Oh lordy, they love making rational, logical decisions and they hate being wrong and they need the public to see them as intelligent 
you know, God forbid I mispronounce a word, which I do all the time because I never, I read a lot, but I don't, I don't speak a lot. You know, my, my friends are not intellectuals, put it that way. Um, uh, and so, but that's a deeply embarrassing, shameful for an analyst. Uh, controllers, they're rational thinkers too. Uh, and they're socially outgoing, usually, usually dominant people, controllers. And they're happiest when they feel powerful, when they get things done. Uh, it's the type of person who may have been called bossy once or twice in their life. May come across that way. No, no, no. May come across a little controlling the, the controllers. It's, yeah, amazing. But they need to be thought of as powerful publicly, you know, um, like publicly. Some is kind of an emotional thinker, um, like a supporter. A supporter is like an emotional thinker usually, and usually socially reserved, a supporter. You know, kind of like stay at home. Uh, he or she likes to be valued by others for being caring, supportive, and reliable. That's how they want to be seen. They're the caring person. They support. They're reliable. They're there. Okay? So... As long as you're matched in ways that are important to you, in your interests, your values, your religion, your politics, those big things that are important to you, as long as you're matched in those, then people who belong in the opposing psychological quadrants, okay, they have a better chance of forming a lasting bond together. They really do, you know. Interest, values, we're on board. Personality, we're kind of opposites. That's the key. I just give you the key. Um, but, but you can see this too. I mean, imagine, imagine two power seekers. Um, I mean, relationships like a boat. You're in that little boat. Uh, look, you're gonna have to live together. Not you got to row the boat together. You have to. I mean, think about that. That, that. Sometimes I think of relationships like that. Like, man, can I be in a boat with this person for like several days? counting them to row and, and not driving each other crazy. Well, I don't know. Imagine two power seekers rowing the same boat, both trying to get dominant. Go this way. No, go this way. I know what I'm doing. No, no, we do it this way. We should row now. Oh, my Lord. Each one wants to set the pace. Each one wants to set the rhythm. And, and also, how far both of them are going to buy for attention and importance. I did this, right? I did that. Did you see how I did that? We know I was right about this. Oh, my Lord. Or even two analyst types, the intelligence seekers. Oh, my Lord. Uh, constantly criticizing each other's decisions. Constantly putting each other down so they'll feel smarter. Or living in fear that they'll appear stupid. My Lord, I remember that. I'm kind of like an analyst type, and I dated this girl who was very, very intelligent. That's fine. Well, it wasn't fine. She was also very educated in specific subjects that I liked. And she, we would argue, ah, you know, argue. And I was so terrified this years ago. But she'd be like, you know, you know, Sartre, uh, you know, what hired your men to buy, uh, you know, Desting was in fact, and let me tell you about Lacan, the Joy Solence. That's actually what he meant by that. Da -da -da -da. And, and it got to the point where, like, I would literally, like, if she'd say anything about anyone, boom, the next day I'd, like, get a book out on them or refresh my memory and just be obsessively looking just so if she brought it up tonight, yeah, I'm gonna have an ex. I know more about Heidegger than her. And da 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 da, -da and it's important to me. That doesn't work. That wasn't good. Do I want a bright girl? Yeah. Uh, but not really into like things that I like, like psychology, philosophy, and poetry. Like, well, poetry would be cool. I mean, whew, jazz chicks, I love jazz too. Uh, those guys get loose. But, um, or even about two value seekers. Uh, each trying to support each other while they're rowing along, disagreeing with everything the other person said, utterly procrastinating, rather than rocking the boat. How well is that going to go? You need one person to kind of speak and be like, this is how it is. This is what we're going to do. Uh, that won't work, you know. So what do you do? We'll, we'll put, a, put the promoter with the analyst. That'd be good. It'd be fun. It'd be well-planned, that trip. 
Uh, and the other person would, would willingly embrace the other person's need to feel smart. You know, promoter would love, you're doing great. Of course you're brilliant. Oh, my Lord. What? Hi to your man. What? My Lord. That just, yeah. That, that, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, oh, I just almost had a, yeah, it was amazing. And, uh, or you compare like a controller with a supporter. That's a great pair, you know. Because that way you have a confident captain and a willing crew, you know. Or uh, a supporter with a promoter. Boy, that'd be very fun, you know. So these are the kind of like matches you can make, you know. Um, so what do you do if you have one of these people? Okay, well, if your partner's an analyst, you respect their ideas. So when they say an idea, and that would drive me, it didn't blow I was, you know, insecure. I'd be like, well, I believe X, Y, and Z. And she'd be like, ah, is that really true? It, it, excuse me? <clears throat> Before I form an opinion, I have read 20 books on this subject, I, 100%. Every opinion I have is backed by meticulous logic. How can you possibly question me? You know, I mean, some analysts can, like, really go out of their heads. They're really easy to deal with, though. Just, I respect your idea. Wow, wow, that sounds very smart, you know? Um, um, uh, if, if you have a, a supporter that's your partner, make sure they feel valued. You know, make sure they feel valued. So these are kind of little secrets, like not only what you're looking for, but when you find them, what you do. Uh, emotions and being emotionally valued is so important, so important. This is the oxygen. This is the oxygen. So these are things you need to do. And, and if you're paired like that, you'll actually want to, you know? I mean, um, you know, uh, it, it, you actually want to. If you're the analyst type, you really do want to, like, say, wow, you're so valued. Because you'll think that, you know, you really will, and you'll feel that. Um, so, if you're a promoter, if you're a promoter, you're supposed to feel most alive, if I'm right, with someone who makes you feel important. So, am I right? I would ask yourself now. See if what I'm saying makes sense. Don't take my word for it. Look back over your relationships with other people, if you're a promoter or whatever you are, and even your friendships. Are your friendships the best friendships, the ones that make you feel important, that really make, let you know that they respect your ideas, your coworkers, whatever? Look over your relationship. What are your best relationships with that person, you know? made you feel important if you're a supporter and if you're a controller they'll look look back the person and so on and so forth I mean, really just think about it get out a pen and think about it you know so feelings really are the key driver to people's sense of self and over time it's damaging you know if you're an analyst who thinks they're very smart and they never I'll, I'll tell you this I had a friend who um he's, he, he won a Pulitzer right I don't use his name He's a good buddy, and uh, he won a Pulitzer, and he's very excited. A Pulitzer, wow, a Pulitzer. you got to be pretty pretty, pretty good with the pen. So he uh, won the Pulitzer, and he comes in the living room with this thing, opens the envelope, looks up, and his girl's there. His girl's half naked. I was, I was actually there, too. And uh, she, she's making eggs or something like that. And he says, she says something like, uh, um, oh, something like, oh, Pulitzer, Pulitzer, what the Pulitzer, or something like that. And she just turns around, she's smoking, she's like, Pulitzer. <laughs> More like Foolitzer. <laughs> so to me, I'm like having a heart attack and jealousy and envy. Oh my Lord, a Pulitzer. You're a Pulitzer, my Lord, like me. I'm like, man, she could not give a crap. Her, and, and I have a lot of poetry buddies. And their wives, like, don't care. I, I talked to them, like, wow, you must be a great, your husband's a poet. Women love poets. Uh, not really. Uh, like, they're like, yeah, I haven't read any of his poems, like, in 20 years. <laughs> like, none? He just published a couple of years ago. You didn't check out the collection? Nope. You know? And it's like, oof, that's rough. That's a little rough ride there. So, uh, again, it's super important to people might not seem important to other people, but if you're controlling it, this is what's important for each personality type. And if you, like for instance, a, a controller, they really thrive when they feel that they're keeping things in line. When they feel all systems are working smoothly, you know, the controllers, yeah, everything's on set. 
But if you make that person feel like they're losing control, first of all, that person will actually probably become a bully. I've seen that a lot. Like the controller, everything's set and I love that and everything's perfect. And the other person's like, yeah, but this, but this, but this, but this isn't working. This is when they, and also they become a bully. They become mean, you know? And guess what? Eventually, that dude, that girl is going to look elsewhere to reestablish their sense of power. That's just how it works. That's what's going to happen. Uh, if you're an analyst and you habitually humiliate them or embarrass them, yeah, well, they're going to go to someone else to look for that respect because that's what they need. You know? is humiliating like you know I've been out with friends and like oh, let me tell you my opinion on Melville and she's like yeah you're an idiot or something like that like, which I deserve half the time but you know it's just like humiliating what me my opinion on Melville my famous opinion on Melville oh my lord how can someone just respect that um, yeah men are very sensitive though uh, you know it, the promoters are great you can screw up a lot with a promoter get yourself a promoter guys you can screw up a lot. But the one thing you can't do is ignore them. And you cannot disapprove of them. Set your boundaries. Let them know. But when they screw up or make mistakes, you can't disapprove of them. Uh, then they will go sulk. I've seen so many guys that, like, if you ignore them, you screw them, boom. These sulky little kids, you know. And they will go and get their appreciation and importance elsewhere. Uh, a supporter, too. They'll put up with a lot. Get a supporter. A supporter make wonderful wives, wonderful husbands. Um, uh, a lot of supporters are teachers or nurses. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you constantly reject their feelings, man, she will just call, curl up into a ball. And, and only sometimes, after a long time, will she trust you again. Uh, yeah, I've been very insensitive, and, and you know we can be. And just, uh, uh, uh. Uh, and you just watch break their hearts. It's terrible, and they just like wilt. It's like, oh no. Um, and it's gonna take time to earn that trust back. Uh, supporters, when you wound them, long time if you go with a supporter be very careful with their hearts these are precious 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 gems that these people are holding um and they'll just leave those she'll go off and get their acceptance somewhere else if she needs to you know uh so you do need mutual enthusiasm you know and by that i mean like this this is a sort of thing in this way what type of people have you felt comfortable with? Just type of person. I'm not talking about romance, even friendships, whatever. Just people you're around, you're just like, wow, you know? Because that's the other thing you hear about uh, long lasting relationships. What I like about this relationship is I don't have to work hard at it, you know? So just look out for people you talk to easily and connect to easily. It could be anywhere. It could be at the store. It could be talking to this person, that person. And just notice their traits. And you're like, huh, it's so easy to talk to this guy. And he's an extrovert, you know, and he's kind of an intellectual, you know, whatever it is. And boom, now you know who you're looking for. Yeah. Um, this whole thing, by the way, the recipe for love. I'll give you the recipe for love. The recipe for love I really should just come out with like a ridiculous book on these things and make a million dollars. But the recipe for love is basic instincts, the ways you'll be matched, the ways you'll be opposite, and the deal breakers. That's it. You get those four down, you can go find love. You're ready. You know what you're looking for. Basic instincts, I mean trust. That's what I was talking about, the feeling, the feeling. You have an instinct, and you know, you know where this person's safe. Now, you might be wrong, so you want to also use your rationality and other people's opinions. But let's just go with that instinct first. First, do you feel safe and trust? That's the first thing, your instinct. That has to be there. 
You know, when you're sitting with someone, you ever sit down with someone and you're talking to them and it's like a little golden light between your heart and their heart and you're just safe and comfortable, so relaxed, so easy to talk to them, you know? All right, we got number one. Um, the next, the others are all about shared values and motivations, you know? Um, the truth is that romantic relationships are based on friendship, bottom line. Friendships are for the people who, who are like each other. So you have to find some aspect where they are like you. That's the matched part, right? Like attracts like, that's that part. The parts that you're going to build a friendship, shared interests, shared values, both of you are Buddhists, something like that. Okay, okay. You need that. Values and motivators, you need to match. You need to match. Know your values, know your motivators, write them down. I'll give you some, some suggestions. And that's how you're going to know, because those are the only people you're going to go for. If you don't share values and motivations, you, you won't respect each other long enough. So look at what's important to you. You know, if his favorite thing is Jesus, and you think, you're not like, oh, that's cool. No, no, you think that is a joke. Like only the most naive idiot. If he, she's a Buddhist and you think how naive these new age friggin' people or whatever, or if he's an idiot. Or she's a Republican, you or die and they know, like you're saying with Stalin over here, Republican now. Get out get in get in the gulag. Whatever it is. You just won't respect the other person. Do some people make go, yeah, that one guy in a billion who we all know. That's it. And even that's like a little shaky, that's a little strange. So, that's the matched part. Basically, you're saying, you're safe. Matched part. Values and motivators. Values and what are you motivated by? You're motivated by beauty, by money, by family. You know? So, check off things that's important to you. Okay? I'm just going to stop there. I'll give you a meditation for self-love. Uh, for the inner child. Because as I say, even after all these things, this can be dependent on a lot of self-talk. And a lot of these wounded children come up and they make you anxious and angry and shut down. How are you going to react to them? Are you going to love them? Are you going to make friends? Even though you hate this, you hate that you get angry. You hate that you get jealous. But are you going to look at those and say, no, no, this is a message trying to help me. I don't like how it's helping me. It is not useful now. But it is a part that's wounded and trying. And this is what it's about. Okay. So let's do a quick body scan. And then we'll uh, go into this meditation. Inner nurture for self-love. <clears throat> so go ahead. And get into the meditative posture. That's with your back straight. But loose, shoulders back and down, chest up, tuck the chin in, and have your feet firmly planted against the floor. And you just go ahead and start bringing the awareness in, start bringing the awareness into your body, start bringing it in. In, 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 and down. Now that we're a little more relaxed, I simply invite you to join me in taking three deep breaths. And I'm going to take a super deep breath. Hold it below the belly. And slowly... Release. Good, good. And now another super deep breath. Hold it below the belly and slowly release. Really? 
invite you to do a body scan and you can focus your loving awareness right on your forehead and just notice any tension spots and you can move your awareness down down around your eyes and just start softening the eyes softening the muscles around the eyes down to the cheeks softening the cheeks down into the jaw just softening the jaw, nice and loose. And now a wave of warm, loving awareness moving down your neck, into your shoulders, down your back, down your spine. Moving down, down, down. Loosen the belly, loosen the hips. Wave of warm, loving awareness rolling down your legs, rolling down your thighs and your calves, all the way down to your feet firmly planted on the ground like roots of a tree. Good. Good. And now in your calm, relaxed, safe place there was something you once saw that was beautiful, breathtaking, Perhaps a scene from nature. What was it? Imagine yourself there in that beautiful setting. Perhaps it was a beautiful sky, a sunset, a meadow, I don't know. But being there now, some place where you felt a bit of peace and excitement deep in your heart. Just for the next few moments, take in this setting with all your senses, the sounds, the smells, the sights, breathing it all in, letting all the colors, the sounds, and the smells bring you vibrancy to your being. As you breathe them in, you feel this vibrancy. Yeah. Yeah. And now, you notice something in the distance. There's something in the distance, something small. You're noticing a faint outline of a child coming right toward you. And as the child moves closer and closer and even a little closer, you notice this is you. This is you as a small child. And you allow yourself a moment to notice the hair, the small body. Look at those eyes. And look at the age. And look at that child's attitude. Look at your expressions. I don't know, are they looking around? Are they curious? Are they looking at you? Are they sad? Yeah. And perhaps this child notices you. And you just invite this child, your child, to sit right next to you at whatever distance you're comfortable with. And as they sit next to you, you notice that they can see you and they sense you 
and they feel you, and then they see you. Hmm. What does the world look like from their eyes, their small, innocent eyes? How does the world feel from their perspective? And you turn to your child and you ask them. You ask them a question. You look at them. This small version of you, so innocent. And you ask, what do you need most from me? What do you need most from me? And allow that child to answer in whatever way is most comfortable. It could be a drawing. It could be a gift. Perhaps your child hands you something. It could be words. But they express exactly what it is and how it needs to be done. Go ahead. Ask your small self, what do you most need from me? Go ahead. Take a moment. Keep going. And assuming you've got an answer, if you're able, and because imagination creates new possibilities and you're in control here, if you're able, you give your child what they need from you right now. Please, go ahead and do that. Go ahead. Do they need a hug? Do they need to go someplace new, a special place? Do they need a friend, a pet? Go ahead. Do they need to be understood? Do they need to tell you something? Do they have a message? Listen. Witness it. Go ahead and do that now. If they're telling you a story, say, what do you need from me now? Do you want a hug? Do you want to know you've been heard? What do you need? And go ahead and give that to them. And if they ask for something you can't give them right now, tell them, your child what you can give them a hug anything you're able to give and if it's something that's possible in the future tell your child this will be possible and give your child a symbolic promise for the future go ahead and do that man. yeah And now, just to make sure, ask your child if there's anything they wish for you to hear. Take a moment now, if you're not already, sit facing them. Is there anything you need me to hear? I'm right here, and I would love to hear it. Go ahead and take a moment to listen. And if you want, you can answer back anything, your perspective, how you see things, anything you'd find helpful. Go ahead. And if it's all right, maybe if it's comfortable, you can hold their hands in your hands. And you look at your child in the eyes, this child that is you, this young child. 
and you tell them that you love them. Say that now. I love you. Tell them you honor them. I honor you. And you tell them, you hear them, I hear you. And you tell them, they have always been enough. You have always been enough. And you know that is true. Go ahead and see what the reaction is. What's the reaction? Yeah. And now, if it feels complete, ask your child. It's up to them. Would they like to come with you? Would they like to come to your home? You could just ask them. It's up to them. If the child says, no, it's not ready, tell them, ask them if it's okay if you come back and visit again. If it's okay, tell them you will, but only say it if you mean it. Only say if you will return. Tell them when. I'll try this weekend. I'll come back. Thank them for their time. And let them know that you will honor them and work toward being together with them. Say that I will continue to honor you and I will continue to work being together with you. Go ahead and tell them that. Yeah. And if your child has chosen to come with you today, give them a moment to say goodbye to their surroundings. Allow them to collect anything they need for the journey. Toys. Anything. Go ahead, grab everything. And then you invite them. You invite them home. And when they're ready, this can be however you want. It could be you holding hands. It could be a warm embrace until you're just warmly holding that small child against you, feeling their heartbeat, pouring love until you just press that child right into your heart right into your heart you make that space in your heart and this child goes right in there where you can always visit it and it's a full integration of self but whatever is most comfortable for both of you at this moment happens as much as you're comfortable to be integrated yeah but whatever you're comfortable with that's all that happens and you allow whatever that Mount is, you allow that integration to occur, bringing you both into wholeness, balance, harmony, and perhaps even notice this wholeness, balance, harmony integrated inside of you as things begin to shift, as things have been shifting. Even now, this change is happening, and perhaps you feel this energy shifting, changing, integrating ordering things inside into a perfect balance. Yeah. Yeah. And now, this integration, knowing, knowing it will continue and feeling perhaps that's mostly complete, the first phase, I'm curious if you would spend a moment in your heart center how does that feel? Does that feel a bit softer? Does it shift? Does it open? Can you feel gratitude? And if you feel gratitude, you feel it in deep appreciation for your inner child, for all the experiences that made you who you are today. Perhaps you'll allow this deep appreciation for your inner child this deep appreciation to move through your body. You can feel this energy of appreciation and gratitude moving and moving through your body, circulating through your entire body like oxygen, like oxygen.
oxygen that's constantly bringing what it needs, constantly bringing the body nourishment and air, constantly bringing in nourishment, constantly taking away what's no longer necessary, exhaling what's no longer needed, inhaling nourishment. And you let this appreciation move through your entire body, letting gratitude fill every part of your being. And it's like a light and it's radiating from your heart. And this feeling of love and gratitude is part of your deepest, highest self and your beautiful unconscious mind is reacting in such a way that things continue to be ordered and integrated in a way that is just lovely and you might be surprised or I don't know you might be delighted to notice this integration, this feeling of appreciation and gratitude deeply anchored in your body. And now when you're ready, take a few deep breaths connecting to your body. You take a deep breath. Exhale. And you feel your body make contact with the chair. You take a deep breath. And you exhale. And you feel the earth underneath you and your feet connecting to the ground. And you take a deep inhale. And then exhale. And now you're back to your body and you come back, back, back. And when you're ready, knowing you've had all the time you need, all your own sweet time to become integrated with this feeling of gratitude. And when you're ready and only when you're ready, open your eyes, eyes open and you're back. And it's today, and you're present and grounded and loved. And uh, if uh, nobody told you that they love you today, just know I love you. And I mean that, even though I don't know you, but you're a human. You've suffered a lot of things I have, and for that I love you. I'll uh, start with part two and part three soon. Meanwhile, if you have any questions or comments, you can find me over at uh, attachmenthealinghelp.com. Thank you for listening.